like when I was in high school, I had no idea that it was actually possible to make a living writing. I kind of thought that was a bit of a pipe dream. Um, but it absolutely is possible, and there's a massive demand for, for writing services everywhere, um, especially with kind of the, the rise and rise of content marketing. Welcome to Jane Jackson Careers, a podcast that takes your career to the next level. Here's your host, Jane Jackson, author of Amazon Careers bestseller, Navigating Career Crossroads. Well, hello and welcome back to My Careers Podcast, where I interview fascinating professionals who've made amazing career changes. And today I'm really honoured to have on the show David Halliday, who's a freelance writer across business, lifestyle and culture. Now, David's work has appeared in numerous print and online publications, and he's consistently appeared in GQ magazine for the last three years. Writing and movies are his passion. He's worked with a range of studios and agencies from Melbourne in Australia to LA and New York in the US. After nearly 10 years of writing and working on scripts, he's developed an extensive personal network of editors, producers, writers and actors. He's also completed three film scripts and two TV show treatments that he's currently developing and pitching. David's also the author of non-fiction book The Bloody History of the Croissant, which sounds fascinating, and is a contributing author to the music that Maton made. When writing on a subject, he enjoys unpicking the human threads of history behind it and consistently finds that a story told well becomes a story about all of us. So let's welcome David to the show and find out the journey he took to become a journalist, a screenwriter and an author. So hello, David. Hello, and thank you for having me. Wow, that's, that was a fantastic introduction. <laughs> There's so much to say because you've done so many things and it's really, really exciting. So yeah. I'm really glad that I met you and um, we, we were discussing an article uh, for GQ magazine and then I found out all about your career journey. So how about, David, let's find out all about you and to kick it off, tell us what were your career aspirations when you were a little boy? A little boy, wow. I mean, aside from the, the usual ones of... I don't know. I think I probably, when I was a kid, I probably wanted to be a, a, a detective or something, and uh, and an archaeologist mm -hmm. like Indiana Jones. But um, actually, I studied a little bit of archaeology in uni. But um, but I think ultimately, I always wanted to be a writer. I was always writing books, um, like little books and making books and stapling things together when uh, I was a kid. So that was always there. Um, and so I sort of progressed through that. Did did lots of writing and. Sort of primary school and secondary school as well did English and all, literature and all that kind of jazz but um yeah I also sort of thought that maybe that wasn't a feasible sort of career option um I think when you're a high school student you don't really have that much of an idea of what's out there um so I think I thought if you want to do that you have to do something else to supplement that income so I decided that you know I thought teaching would always be fun too um, so I thought I'd combine the two and use one to kind of facilitate the other. But, you know, that's not easily done uh, when you're teaching because I think it's such an all-consuming profession. It's very rewarding, but um, you're not left with that much energy for much else. So, yeah, so I went into teaching, um, taught for you know a bunch of years, um, and, yeah, I was, I was always kind of trying to write on the side as well. Um, and I struck up some good relationships with some people at some creative studios and, and did some sort of treatment work for them, some concept work and um, some script work on the side, which was great. Um, but it sort of got to the point where I was turning away work because I needed to, I don't know, do like piles of marketing or write an exam or something. And so... Yeah, so I guess that's sort of the short version. Yeah, I think, I mean, it, it is yeah. really, really difficult to juggle two different jobs as well. And I guess, you know, even though it's such a romantic notion to be a writer, I guess you were thinking about the starving artist syndrome yeah. <laughs> as, an, uh, as, as a writer, which I, I, exactly. I guess a lot of people think, can, exactly. I really, can I really make a living out of this? And so an option which perhaps was more viable was to teach. What age group were you teaching? Um, I taught from year seven to year 11 at the start and then just sort of moved to, it was mainly like just like year nine to year 11 mostly. I really enjoyed it and there's, you know, great kind of 
um, I don't know, it was kind of like getting paid to just talk about all the stuff that I was interested in anyway. And I kind of thought it was kind of like getting away with something. Mm. <laughs> and so what what so when you were writing and you started writing film scripts or doing a little bit of freelance writing when did that sort of transition come when you decided actually I think I can make a living out of this and then you transitioned out of teaching into full-time writing yeah good question well I was I sort of I took steps to sort of slow down the teaching and um, started doing it much more on a like a, a CRT emergency kind of basis. So I was like an emergency teacher for a long time um, while I would write on the side. Um, but at the same time, yeah, it was – but when I actually made the, the, the sort of full-time transition where I was like, okay, it's going to be both feet into into this, this new adventure and see how it all works, that was probably only about – four years ago or so about four years ago now um up to that point I think I'd been really lucky with opportunities like up to that point I'd um been writing for for creative studios for a number of years um I'd done the croissant book which is great um it was a, a a really sort of strange way that that came about and um and yeah so I think so I, I think I, up to that point, I had sort of had enough momentum in the writing game to be actually sort of thinking, all right, let's do this seriously and let's let's actually see if we can do this. Um, and, you know, I was sort of getting enough work at the time where I was able to, you know, when I was teaching, I was sort of having to turn away stuff. And so, yeah, I thought time to jump in, both feet, see what happens. And uh, it was sort of precisely at that moment that all the work disappeared um, <laughs> and that was that was a really interesting wake up call because you're like, all right, well that's that's it. What what do I do now? Um, yeah, so it was, it was a very steep learning curve at the start, sort of working out w- what you do in a in a situation like that. Yeah, it must have been really really challenging. But but I mean, obviously you're a talented writer because I read you know some of the reviews and what people say about what you've written and this. I want to find out more about this bloody history of the croissant. What was that all about? Tell me tell me about the book. It's such a great oh, title. It, yeah, it's um that started. I was writing for a, like a French lifestyle magazine for a while. Well, it's like English magazine, French theme, and. I was writing for them for a bit, but I was kind of more kind of lifestyle culture pieces and, you know, strange little bits of history and things like that as well. So it sort of came across this um, this this sort of story, this mythology that surrounded um, the croissant, which I found fascinating and wrote that into a, a piece for them and then decided that, um, you know, there was much more that I wanted to explore in that area and hadn't wasn't really able to find out much more about it, um, much more out about it, but... Um, yeah, just decided to, to to pitch it to some companies, and there was um, I had a contact at uh, Australian Scholarly Publishing, and ran it past him. I, that was actually I I, pub, I pitched it to uh, one of the one of the guys who was running Penguin at the time, um, back when Penguin was just Penguin, not Random House as well. And yeah, he he laughed at it. He thought it was ridiculous, and I was I saw where it was coming from, and I was just like, "All right, that's fine. It's he's allowed to laugh at that." Um, and then when I ran it past the Australian Scholarly, they were like, "Oh, Penguin didn't like it, huh? All right, well maybe we'll we'll see what we can do with it, and um, and then we'll see if we can kind of make them eat their words, kind of thing." But um, yeah, it was really interesting experience. So that was, I mean, it took it's uh, it was a took a long time to kind of you know, research and write and do all that sort of stuff. So it's kind of, yeah, I think towards the end I was like, all right, let's put this to bed. But, um, yeah, it was a very interesting experience. I think writing, I mean, it's so hard, isn't it? Because when you're a writer and everything that you write is is so precious to you, isn't it? And then having to, you know, pitch it to a publisher and if they reject it or if they're not interested, it's almost like they're rejecting you, not just your book. So it must have been quite an emo- emotional roller coaster <laughs> ride for you. Yeah, well, I think I'd had a lot of stuff rejected before. I'm... Um, in terms of just you know pitching short fiction to various places, and I think that's that's a really good way to learn to not take things too personally. Um, I think when it's when it's kind of maybe a bigger project, I think it's probably maybe easier to kind of go, oh man, they're rejecting that. Maybe they're rejecting me, and then it's. I think I think I 
you know, it wasn't a nice feeling at the time um, as, you know, I guess any of that stuff isn't going to be too nice. But um, I think I think I got over it pretty quickly. And then I think, I mean, now on a day-to-day basis, you have to pitch them, pitch ideas to people all the time and things get rejected most of the time. And I think if you're not okay with that, then life's going to be very hard. But I think if you are okay with that, then then that's great. Because, you know, if, if people reject an idea, it's it's nothing to do with you so much. It's more that just, this is not really what they're looking for for the publication at that given time. So I think at that time, that was, that, that was, that was part of learning that. And so I think... Yeah, I guess I'm glad that happened. You know, so so what advice would you give, say if there was a young writer like yourself who has a brilliant idea for a book mm. and you've spent a lot of time writing the book and and refining it and editing it and you think, okay, I'm ready to fling it out in the world now. What would be the best way for a young writer to approach a publisher? Good question. Wow, if I, if I think I knew that, then <laughs> I don't know. Um no, what's the best way to, for them to approach a publisher? If they've got a really good manuscript that's really strong, I think what I would advise to do before they approach a the publisher even um, is to is to get a, another sort of set of eyes on it, like uh, maybe pay for a manuscript appraisal, um, get a couple of people who they trust to get them to read it, um, send little bits and pieces to, to, to people who, uh, you know, have have a you know respectable opinion um get as much feedback as possible and this is this is once the thing's done that you, know, you they still need to be able to, to to polish it up because i think depending on where you are um in your writing career i think your opinion of what is really going to work is going to change um and so you know if they're a young writer you know what what you think is amazing when you're 20 years old is going to be markedly different to what you think is amazing when you're 25 years old when you're 30 years old when you're 35 years old i think i think it's sort of a, a, a sliding scale um but yeah I'd, for them i would say get as much feedback as you can and be okay to you know receive ideas that that maybe i don't know that you hadn't previously thought of and be be open to to constructive criticism um but then ultimately I think the best way to approach the publisher would be to, uh, with with a very with a very open mind and just kind of being like not trying any tricks or anything like don't like it's not necessarily in the in the way you write your your pitch email even though it should be it should be grammatically perfect it's it's like that's not necessarily the most important thing I think that the work should speak for itself to a large extent but um yeah I'm I'm not sure how helpful that is that's really valuable because it really is being able to approach someone and know what you're going to say and make sure that what what they're actually um, providing to to the publishing house is something that is going to be relevant for them and probably in the right genre of work as well I, I would expect um, so thank you I think that would yeah. be really helpful for anybody but but so okay so writing books and then co-authoring books and then writing scripts and then writing for magazines it sounds like you've done it all um, <laughs> I mean and so interesting too so what would you what would you say is your favorite bit is it script writing uh, authoring books or writing articles or writing for magazines what is it that really motivates you I think they all have their appeal I mean they, they're all they're also different in their own way um I, I really like uh, yeah, great. Yeah, I'm not sure because I mean, writing writing a book is very very solitary. It's but it, it allows you to to do a lot more things and kind of take a lot more control over over what you're doing. Um, and whereas you know, writing a magazine is you need to abide by a certain sort of publication tone. Um, so you know, you, you're free to be yourself to a certain extent. Um, you have to be mindful of who the reader is all the time. I mean, you have to do that with whatever you're writing for. Um, it's not it's not about you. It's you know you're writing for someone else. Um, so I think with with the magazine, it's a little bit more more prescriptive so much, but in some way, it sort of is because you have to you have to pitch and get the idea accepted, and you have to write to that brief and that kind of thing. But um, I do really enjoy that because it means that if you want to I don't know if you have an idea that you love or if there's someone you want to talk to you can write a brief that caters to that like there was one um like for example I was I was writing a, an article for 
this was this was for like was for a piece for realestate.com it was it was an article that was going to be pitched to agents and it's not online anymore i don't think you can see it but um it was all about it was it was this kind of um platform that was designed to kind of help agents do their job better um and I, I don't know anything about real estate and i'm kind of it was just more about connecting them with really interesting people that could potentially offer some sort of value um and so i thought i was going to write a piece on body language because i found this 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 guy who was who's in counterintelligence in the fbi and he'd written extensively on on body language and sort of um and how to read body language and things like that um and I kind of thought, oh, it'd be great to get in touch with this guy. So I, I pitched a couple of, um, a couple of ideas, and that enabled me to, to talk to all these kind of, yeah, to this FBI guy. And so I did it again, and with a, with like a different FBI guy, it was hilarious. So it, it was a really strange experience because they're, um, yeah, I mean, the first guy who who was who I talked to about kind of building rapport, um, really charming to the point of being extremely disarming. Um, this guy's name was uh, Robin Drake. D- I would definitely recommend his stuff. Um, but um, yeah, really strange. So I was interviewing this guy for for an article, and halfway through, like a ninja, he flips it around and he starts interviewing me and sort of starts asking all about kind of my my life and my job and my career and my aspirations and stuff. And then towards the end, I was and like, because his his job was trying to get um, people like operatives who didn't have America's best interests at heart um, and try to get them to share information with him. Um, and his like the way he would do that is to try to treat people really nicely and treat people really well and build rapport with people. And um, towards the end, I was sort of like, man, I can see how he does that. You just kind of like, at the end, you're kind of like, oh, I feel very comfortable telling this guy anything. Um, <laughs> really strange, but that's, that's a massive <laughs> digression but um i think part of the answer to that to your initial question is um i really enjoy the aspect of meeting and talking to really interesting people um for the magazines and i find that amazing but i think that maybe that's yeah, that's you get to do that in in you know writing scripts as well you get to talk to interesting directors and stuff but i think in that sort of side of things there's always i don't know i think i think the magazines and interviewing just interesting people and maybe getting to the bottom of certain topics or ideas that hadn't sort of, I don't know, that you hadn't quite considered before or topics that you hadn't, I don't know, like I wrote an article just recently about um, like homelessness in Melbourne and another one about, you know, prisoners getting out of prison and sort of what happens there kind of thing. And I don't know. Yeah. I find that really interesting. Yeah. I can relate to that so much. Actually when, when, I first started to get to know you, you were asking me questions, I ended up asking you questions and it was so interesting finding out yeah. about you. So yeah. I, I think it's just that because you've actually had a really oh, interesting <laughs> an interesting path and I love interviewing people too. And isn't it fun because everyone that you meet yeah. You know they've got Absolutely. a different they've got a different story too, and um, actually what what's interesting is one of my clients I met she was just so amazing she was a um, forensic investigator with the New South Wales Police and she went through so much stuff in her life and she'd actually written two books as well yeah. one was called Crime Scene uh, the Life of a Forensic Investigator her name is Esther Mackay and even though she was my client I yeah. I just was so impressed by her. Uh, work ethic and her integrity and her values that I end up interviewing her on this podcast as well and Ooh. it's it's I learn so much from everybody yeah. just the same as I'm learning so much from you um, and you're right I think when you've got an inquisitive mind which obviously you yeah. do and I think anyone who writes or is really interested in English literature and English language and people really what makes people tick right I mean you ask questions you know about homelessness or whatever yeah. it might be you you learn something Something yeah. different about a completely different way of life and you know so we live in our own little bubbles but you know just being able to get into the psyche of different yeah. people is fascinating and I'm not surprised that 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 other um a script writer that you were interviewing started interviewing you because he would have just naturally wanted to get into your psyche as well <laughs> Yeah, it's it's really strange when you think you've kind of got people worked out. You sort of think that you meet some more people and interview some more people. And you're like, man, people are very surprising and uh, and extremely interesting. Yeah, 
Uh, so now back yes. back to you, David. Okay, never mind about everybody else. Back to you. And so uh -huh. you write for magazines. What's the hardest thing about being a freelance writer? Uh, probably uh, hustling all the time for for new business is is often kind of tricky. I mean, it kind of the the, the way you work often goes in waves. It, it kind of depends. Like it, I often got about, about five or six articles on go any given time. Um, and then sometimes when that drops off, you're like, okay, I need to prepare for the, a certain time in future when I can you have to keep on pitching while you're writing articles, which I find quite interesting to make sure it's a much more consistent period of work. Um, so I think, I mean, there are times when things die down when you start, you know, once you've filed a, a couple of pieces, then like it's up to you to make sure that you've got enough to go on. Um, I think I've been pretty lucky with setting up some good relationships with some good editors. So now I often get approached by people um, to to do more um, to do more writing. Like like GQ, for example, will will get in touch with me. I'm a, they'll say, you know, what what are you thinking for the next issue um, for for GQ Wink, which is the business section, and we'll kind of have a chat about certain ideas. And that's great because that means that. You know that's that's something that I don't have to pitch for, which is just awesome. Um, and then a couple of other magazines, you know, will, that, that they might send me a couple of ideas and say, "What do you reckon? You want to you want to take up one of those things?" And you know, if it's interesting, if it's interesting, then yeah, absolutely. And so, um, I think setting up relationships is pretty important. Um, but you know, that's yeah, as with setting up any relationships in life, getting to know people takes time, and it's not necessarily something that can be done easily. I think developing an idea that you, you can actually get it. I don't know. What am I trying to say? Uh, developing that this um, maybe grit, I suppose, that mm. you can just keep on pitching regardless of, of which ones get rejected. I think that's that's probably one of the most important things you could do because, I mean, for a young writer, they might pitch 10 magazines that they want to write for and odds are they'll be rejected by all of them. And so that, writer will then think, well, I'm no good, so I'll just go do something else. Um, whereas really, I mean, that's going to happen. That's, you know, your first 10 pitches, they'll probably get rejected. And that's just something you got to deal with and then just kind of keep going. And so I think that element of keeping going, that's probably the, the most important thing because, you know, one day it'll be much easier and you won't have to work as hard to pitch it. And, you know, like all things, it'll, you know, you just build on that. Yeah, you know that's so interesting because as a as a freelance writer, obviously there's going to be rejection. Not everyone's going to say yes all the time. But you mentioned the word grit, and this yeah. is exactly what I was talking about in my previous podcast uh, with a gentleman called Paul Lyon, who runs a business. He's the founder of a business called Mental Toughness Partners. And during our interview, he was talking about grit as well yeah. and how people are able to bounce back from oh really really difficult challenges in their lives and it's all about um, having the courage and the resilience to keep going and and you know you were saying how some people you know they pitch maybe five or ten articles or whatever gets rejected and then they give up and think no I'm not for yes. this this career but if you've got enough desire and determination and you know that you're pretty good at what you do you, you can't become excellent unless you keep at it and keep at it and sometimes it is the squeaky wheel uh, but then of course you've also got to have a talent yeah. because if you don't have the talent it's not going to work anyway so you obviously do I'm just having a look at your list of honours and awards, David. OK, you've got the FAW National Literary Awards, 2011, then the Golden Key Academic yeah. Honour Society, so oh, yeah. you're a clever one, the Penguin Fiction Award, yeah. the Mark Twain Royal Non-Such Humour Writing Awards, so you write comedy also. And, yeah, uh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, that's, so I've a, been doing a, some, yeah. Yeah, there's there's a lot going on there. There's so much here, and actually now I'm I'm scrolling <laughs> through your LinkedIn profile, and and there's all this fantastic stuff. You did some work with Jack Thompson, and then oh that 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 uh, movie Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea, and gosh, there's just been so much. Yeah. What is what is it that you love the most about what you do? Yeah, just the the, the endless variety. I think is great. Um, I I love that. Um, yeah, I, th I think, I th yeah, I don't know. The idea that you can actually do something you like and be paid for it, and that's that—that's how you're going to pay the electricity bill this month, is 
by doing something that you like. And that's that idea fascinates me. Like, well, that's that's really interesting because at one point, you know, when you're kind of getting started, kind of like, well, I'm going to need to make rent somehow this month. Uh, what are we going to do? And you just kind of think, well, it's just, <laughs> I don't know, just keep going, I guess. Um, but I think, you know, I think I've been really lucky with, you know, making some some connections with people and, um, you know, really lucky with the, the agencies that I've been working with as well. And um, so I, I've, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how much credit I can I can take for for all that sort of stuff. I think you know that's yeah. I don't know. Yeah, just I think yeah. I think life probably had a big part of it. I don't know. <laughs> you know, you know what, David? I think writers feel very uncomfortable talking about themselves, <laughs> and especially when you know you know <laughs> that you know <laughs> that you've done some. Because honestly, I mean, just having a look at what you've written and everything that you've you've actually you know got down there that that people will be able to read forever that belongs to David Halliday is really, it's quite phenomenal, isn't it? It's like you've left a legacy. I think that that's one of the most wonderful things about being a writer or being a script writer, you know, whether it's books or articles or movie scripts or whatever it might be, it's something that will always be there. People will always be able to find it, won't it? And I think that's, that's like a wonderful legacy that you'll that's be um, leaving for the world. It's a, it's a bit of a scary thought, isn't it? Mm. So, especially when you're kind of doing the final revisions on a piece and kind of, you know, there might be a typo that you missed. You're like, you missed that, then uh, a typo is going to be around when I'm fertilising daisies. <laughs> well, I'd rather That's focus a, on the, the positive. The negative approach. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, um, well, this, this could make an interesting but, uh, piece. But, you know, if, if, it's, if it's good, then that's that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's right but i'm sure yeah. you wouldn't let it out there on us it was amazing so so that was really interesting so what what advice would yeah. you give um any young graduate or, or anyone who might even be still in high school or just graduating and thinking you know is writing is writing a career that i can pursue what what would be the key aspects of this career that you you could provide some advice on Yeah, that's that's probably a good question. I think, uh, like when I was in high school, I had no idea that it was actually possible to make a living writing. I kind of thought that was a bit of a pipe dream, um, but it absolutely is possible. And there's a massive demand for for writing services everywhere, um, especially with kind of the the rise and rise of content marketing. Um, you have agencies all over the place, you know, fork out good money for for writing that's done well. Um, so for, for anyone kind of considering it, um, I would say, I mean, the, the, the writing that pays the best has to do with marketing and advertising. So I would consider maybe studying something like that. I would also consider, um, or I would advise maybe doing an internship at, at an advertising agency potentially um, or like a content agency because I think that the lessons you would learn there would be invaluable. Like, that, yeah, that would probably be one of the most important things you could do. Also, um, being very careful about what you studied, I think, is probably important because, I mean, you could spend years studying something that might not bring you that much closer to where you want to be in the end, um, whereas I think something like um, doing an internship probably would. I mean, yeah, I, I think it probably depends on what you want to do with with writing and kind of how you want to, how you want to make a living doing it. I mean, I've... I've got um, got a couple of connections. Or I think it's guys, my second cousin potentially. And if he's listening, hey, his name's Dave, and I haven't actually met him, but um, <laughs> he writes he writes sci-fi novels on on Kindle for a living, and I think he does very well for himself, just writing sci-fi. And you're like, that's. I mean, that's. I find that baffling and mind-boggling that someone can actually do that because I mean, but the thing is, we live in a world where that's possible, but. Um, yeah, that, that someone can actually just go, you know what, I'm just going to write science fiction and that's what I do now. And and they just they just start doing it and they start, you know, making a living for themselves. I find that, I find that, like, absolutely have tons of respect for that. But, um, mm. Yeah, and I would probably, I'd probably try something like that if I was brave enough. But um, no, <laughs> I don't know. Um, it, I find that fascinating. But so things like that are possible. That's mm. what I would... I, 
bringing it back to the question. It's it's possible to do um, if you want to do it. And there's and I would probably also advise that there's there's a massive spectrum of of kind of things you could do um, if you wanted to write. There's so many different niches that you know you just have no idea about. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's definitely possible. Just look into it and then, you know, the closer you look, the bigger that world gets and then the more opportunities seem to appear. Um, yeah, so that's – so I, I think it would be a positive message. Mm-hmm. I think that's going to be really, really helpful. It's – I mean, certainly, you know, you're right with, you know, like – marketing content is is such a big deal now because everyone's talking about content marketing and you know help, helping people to get yeah. to know like and trust you before they're actually going to buy and for so many businesses that's what the, the big focus is cool. on now it's not so much sales it really is it's the content marketing and developing the relationship and whenever anyone reads anything it's an experience of you isn't it but you know talking about um your your relative who writes sci-fi novels on kindle and and making a good living out of it what he's done is i believe is that he's found a niche and even though sci-fi novels on kindle are not for everybody they are for certain people and those people who are into it that's all they want and they devour more and more and more uh, of those stories it's a little bit like you know those very popular television shows that aren't for everybody but some people really love it um <laughs> and a bit like the walking dead you know, like, like like um so so many of my family yeah. members love the I'm, I'm just not into it because i just dip in and out and i just think that's not very nice but they love it and they go jane if you listen to the if you follow the that's whole fine. story you'll get sucked in and it'll be amazing and they just can't wait for the next episode episode and the next episode and what's going to happen and and it's a but it's a niche isn't it and so sci-fi novels it, it's a niche novel and it's Absolutely. a bit like when I was growing up because I'm so long in the tooth now I mean Star Trek was a big deal I, I'm such a Trekkie I'm just I'm a big yeah. Trekkie and if there's anything to do with Star Trek I'm into it The Walking Dead maybe not so but you know it's a different yeah. niche isn't it but I think if you find something yeah. that you just love and you Absolutely. know there'll be someone else who's into it, then um, that could be a career option. Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, I think now, I mean, given the, I don't know, the, that's, I, th- I like that idea. I sort of, maybe that's, that's worth stressing that like, if you're into something, then chances are there's enough people out there who are really into that as well for you to make it, make something of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I think you'd have to, you well, you need to do the research first. But but certainly what you've done now is you've Absolutely. given everyone some hope that, you know, if you have a passion and you want to be a writer <laughs> or a script writer, whether it's for movies or novels or magazines or whatever, it is very, very possible to do it um, as a career and not just as a sideline. And also the freelance lifestyle, it's not so bad, is it? As long as you develop that personal resilience and self-reliance and you don't wait for someone else to do it for you you just bounce back if someone says no you bounce back yeah. someone else says no you keep pitching and you keep pitching because i think the, the one the one truth is in our lives is that we are always pitching aren't we yeah 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 i like that Mm, yeah, because I mean, Definitely. honestly, for all of us, we never we never know exactly what's going to be around the corner. But if the more people who know who know you, who like you, and who trust you, and you deliver, and obviously you deliver. I mean, for example, with with this wonderful, with all the wonderful assignments you get from GQ magazine, which is huge, they keep coming back because you're delivering yeah. really high quality content for them and so you know that's excellent for your reputation as well plus all of the awards which is nice it's lovely getting awards um you know you've got great qualifications behind you and anyway i'm very excited i'm going to follow your your journalistic career path david (laughs) now that i've i've got to know you a little bit more and um now i could talk to you all night except it's now a monday evening and it's getting a little bit late and um i would like to actually have, have you back on the podcast again if you will um, say in about six months' time, and tell me what new yeah, projects, absolutely. what new projects that you're working on. Absolutely, yeah. that's that'll inspire me to um, to I don't know, step up, <laughs> up and do something new. Thank you so much, David. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you.
Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. You can get a free audiobook download and free 30-day trial at audibletrial.com forward slash Jane Jackson Careers. There are over 180,000 book titles to choose, so give it a go and get your free audiobook today from audibletrial.com forward slash Jane Jackson Careers. You've been listening to Jane Jackson Careers. Sign up to receive regular career advice at janejacksoncoach.com.